strong as a cedar, sweet as a fig. Today we will consider two kinds of trees that God created that feature prominently in scripture, the cedar and the fig. They are both important in the Bible, but in many ways they are opposites. A cedar is a majestic tree with green boughs and a sturdy trunk. A cedar tree is sought for its strength. The fig, however, is a small and tender tree needed for its sweet fruit and large leaves. Fig trees make their appearance early in the biblical narrative. In the Garden of Eden, God provided Adam and Eve with the fig tree for their enjoyment, along with all the other wonderful um, fruits in the garden. The fig leaves so long ago provided the first clothing for the disobedient couple, which they sewed together after they disregarded God's commandment and ate fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Was the fruit they took from that tree, in fact, a fig? This morning, I want to suggest that the cedar and the fig tree represent two dimensions of the Christian faith. The cedar stands for the majesty of God, and the fig for the mercy of God. As we delve into our passages this morning, we will see that the cedar exhibits the universal power of the Lord, whereas the lowly fig shows his mercy and loving kindness. Our passage from 1 Kings 5, which John read for us, describes the peace treaty that uh, and the shared friendship between the ancient Near Eastern monarchs, King Hiram of Tyre and King Solomon of Israel. King Hiram was a true friend of King David since he uh, answered right away to the request of Solomon, speaking with him after he was anointed king and um, reassuring him he would provide assistance. Hiram is described as a person of faith and discernment who thought well of Solomon. In fact, Hiram praised God because Solomon showed wisdom. The height of the cedars compare well with the heights of generosity required on both sides to make the plans for building the temple of God in Jerusalem become a reality. It took a vast number of highly skilled workers and material resources to accomplish the undertaking. There were no cedar trees in Israel, so they had to be imported. Ever since ancient times, cedars were used by the Egyptians for shipbuilding. You know, the cedar wood is like so good for preserving. That's why you have a cedar closet. It keeps the moths out. They don't want to be anywhere near it. And it also has this water uh, repelling quality. And that's why it could be sent down as wraps um, on the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, the relationship between Egypt and Israel has been fraught with difficulty for thousands of years, since the time when a new pharaoh arose who did not remember Joseph. The Egyptians enslaved the family of Israel, and God sent Moses to lead them out miraculously through the Exodus. Israel's neighbor to the north, Lebanon, is known for its cedar trees, and the cedar forests are uh, referred to. In scripture, we have 131 references to the cedars in Lebanon. A flourishing green cedar tree is the symbol of Lebanon on its flag. The famous cedar forest there is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, protected since 1985. Thankfully, during the time of King David and his son Solomon from about 1000 BCE onward, Lebanon was a trustworthy ally and trade partner. When it came time for the Temple of God to be built in Jerusalem, their diplomatic relations and long-standing friendship were essential to making it happen. This included the trees which were cut down and sent from Tyre and Sidon on the coast of the Mediterranean, north of Israel where Lebanon is today. They were used in the architecture of the temple. Stone workers also came from Gebal in Lebanon, the mountainous area, to build the massive stone foundation. And the workers had to be conscripted. I think it's so cool that considering how hard the work was, 
Solomon was like, okay, I'm going to force you to do this labor, but you'll have one month on and two months of rest before it's your turn again. On Israel's side, the material resources required, in addition to stone, were the payment of wheat and olive oil for food for King Hiram's entire household and staff. Thousands of people, laborers and supervisors, worked together to accomplish the tasks. And these arrangements between King Hiram and King Solomon went on for as many years as it took to complete the structure according to God's specifications. What is the symbolic meaning of including a foreign cedar in God's temple in Jerusalem? In my view, the inclusion of this cedar indicates that God draws all things to his holy temple. While the temple is located in a particular place, God's presence is not bound by its courts. God demanded that Solomon import the finest and strongest trees from a foreign country to adorn God's dwelling place in Jerusalem. Doesn't this suggest that God wants us also to bring the finest ideas of humankind into the church as well? Just think of the wonderful discoveries of scientists like Einstein or technologists like Alan Turing the universality of God's majesty means that all genuine and true science and philosophy should be imported into the church and make its strong beams that give glory to God. Figs, unlike cedars, did not initially inspire awe. The fruit of the fig tree can be purple, black, or green, and inside there are many small seeds. I read a book this week titled Figs, A Cultural History by David C. Sutton. The majority of figs produced today are sold as preserved fruit, dried or canned in uh, jars, used in um, jams and so forth, with approximately only 3% fresh figs. I admit, the first time I ate a fig in Athens, Greece, it took my family some convincing for me to actually try it. I didn't like the look of it. But then when I ate it, I realized how sweet and delightful it is. As you think about scripture, dates are also very sweet, but they have a big pit. Planting a date palm tree is an intentional act, but the many seeds of the fig are a reminder of the role of nature that the birds who eat the figs can scatter and help plant the seeds of the tree far and wide. It's like Jesus' parable of the sower, who generously scatters as many seeds as he can on every field, on every type of soil, in hope that by this generosity, everyone will be blessed by the abundance shared freely everywhere. As we think about it, the fig represents the mercy of God, and the fig is a delicacy for Jews, Christians, and Muslims. It's kind of a luxury item. We found a quotation from the prophet Muhammad, who once remarked, if I should wish a fruit brought into paradise, I should certainly wish for a fig. In India, Siddhartha, who became the Buddha, rejected a mango tree and selected a fig tree as the place where he would seek enlightenment. After 49 days of fasting and prayer, he became enlightened as the Buddha under the vows of the ficus religiosa. In the New Testament, the fig features prominently in several passages as well including the time when Jesus called Philip to follow him and his friend Nathaniel was sitting under a fig tree. In Jewish tradition, a fig tree with its large leaves is a good place to sit undisturbed when studying the Torah. Was he meditating on God's word as he sat there? Interpreters consider that perhaps Nathaniel, whose Hebrew name means gift from God, was a devout Jew who was searching the scriptures for 
promises of God's salvation. And when he met Jesus, he joyfully came to faith that Jesus is the Messiah as soon as he called him. But there is one fig tree episode with a strange twist. In Mark chapter 11, we see Jesus cursed a fig tree in Jerusalem, causing it to wither. Here's what it says. Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples heard him say it. The disciples evidently recounted this episode because of its oddity. Why was Jesus unfair to the fig tree? How could the fig tree be expected to bear fruit out of season? Here we discover the paradoxical quality of grace. The mercy and grace of God are not natural qualities. When God shows us mercy, it is always a miracle of divine intervention and love. Grace is always like a fig appearing to us out of season. God benevolence when we least expect it, but when we most need it. The fig tree that Jesus cursed withered and died. In the morning, as the disciples went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. When the disciples ask him about why the tree has withered, Jesus responds with what seems like a tangent, have faith in God. If you really think about it, what is the greater miracle for one tree to blossom and produce fruit out of season or for the creator of everything in the entire universe to become incarnate and to walk around and to go on the water and to be living among us in the midst of God's creation. Christian theologians over the years have tried to domesticate grace, to turn it into the fruit of human labor and human righteousness. By tending to their gardens, they hope to produce good fruit in season. These rationalizing theologians believe that God has granted us good soil, what they term prevenient grace. And then God judges us based on whether our orchard produces good fruit in season. After all, didn't Jesus say, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. But the grace of God eludes our ability to domesticate it. Just as God provided Adam and Eve with fig leaves to hide their nakedness after the fall from grace, God provides the fruit of the Holy Spirit to us both in and out of season. The story of the cursed fig tree shows the limits of any natural metaphor for mercy. Divine mercy is not a natural event. God's divine mercy comes only through the goodness and loving kindness of God. And so it comes to us at any time and any season. The cursed fig tree bears witness to the failure of the domestication of grace. Interestingly, the English church recognized the hidden meaning of this parable in a nearly forgotten feast day called Fig Sunday. As David C. Sutton remarks, Fig Sunday, also known as Fig Pie Week, is certainly mentioned in sources on folklore and custom as falling on a Sunday in Lent. Some sources specify the Sunday before Easter. Others imply an earlier Sunday in Lent with a link to the strange story of Jesus Christ and the fruitless fig tree on the road to Bethany. But the author goes on to note that Fig Sunday has shifted location in our liturgical calendar to Christmas tide. After all, don't we call for figgy pudding when singing, we wish you a Merry Christmas. I believe the shift occurred because the medieval church recognized the significance of this parable. God creates the fruit of grace 
out of season. So we serve figgy pudding in the bleak midwinter to celebrate God's goodness both in and out of season. Praise the Lord. The Caesar represents the majestic universality of God. Just think that God's temple in Jerusalem was built from foreign wood. This signifies that God is the God not only of Israel, but of the entire world. The fig represents the tender mercy of God. In stark contrast to the barren fig tree, which denied Christ its fruit because it was not the right season, God offers us figs of mercy, sweet, tender love, when we cannot reasonably expect them. The fig becomes a sign of God's overwhelming mercy, flowing to us even when nature and society say we cannot expect it and do not deserve its sweetness to come our way. What are you producing in this season of your life? As you go out today, keep these two trees in mind. You may also find God's wisdom in a foreign country. Do not be afraid to look and bring that richness back to adorn our chapel. At the same time, God's mercy is not limited by season. Just as God shows you mercy in season and out, show mercy to your neighbors, whether you think they deserve it or not. Believe in the God who rises majestically like a cedar and gives you grace, paradoxically like a fig tree that always bears fruit. Amen. Amen.